Welcome to the Facebook Live. Hoping that's going to stay still. You know what? I'm going to do something. Sorry. Here we go. That should work better. Okay. <laughs> Welcome to day four of quarantine. <laughs> uh, we're going to be talking, uh, well, it feels that way. Uh, we're going to be talking about attraction. And let's just start with you know, who among us currently is in a position to be casting stones on this front? <laughs> I think most of us are, you know, I got ready for this and my kids are like, wow, oh, you can't hear me? Oh, you can hear me. Thank you, Ruby. I thought you said you can't. Okay, good. Uh, so my kids were like, why, why do you look so nice? <laughs> Which is to say uh, that uh, if you're like me, many of us have been in sweatpants and, uh, looking relaxed and casual for the past four days and uh, four weeks, I mean, and uh, making our spouses have to focus on character to feel attracted. So anyway, but these are good times. So let me just take you um, to some of the questions we're going to look at today. Um, I'm going to answer two and maybe a third one that's very much related around attraction and let me just say a few things about attraction just to start with. Um, I think attraction issues are often in their core a way of not dealing with your relationship. It's a way of uh, using the sort of immediate response of lack of desire and lack of attraction as a way to give yourself a pass or to sort of step away from and not deal with what's at the core of the feelings of non-attraction, what it has to say about you, what it is going on within you, perhaps, what's going on within your spouse or in the relationship dynamic. And similarly, attraction is very fluid. That is, that attraction is largely meaning-based. So the meanings that are operating within the couple are going to have a huge impact on how desirable you see your spouse. That's why uh, you can be attracted to your spouse when they're 70, okay? When you don't, you don't fit any sort of biological, uh, meaning any sort of social notions of what constitutes beauty or attractiveness and still find your spouse very attractive. Um, so there are some biological realities and, and there is research that shows that you will tend to be drawn to people who have a different um, immune system in a sense, like a different, I can't, I'm not gonna use language in the right way, but basically that your children will have higher immunity if you tend to, if you uh, reproduce with certain people and you will find their pheromones more attractive, right? Um, and so that is, uh, true and there are certain people that they walk in a room you're gonna find them more attractive than others and so that's there is some biological basis around attraction for sure we are more attracted to people who are young and perky because that's part of reproduction uh, so there are some of those factors but they there are plenty of people who are in arranged marriages who create good sexual relationships, they collaborate and they create something meaningful and valuable for them in a marriage that doesn't demand sort of the initial attraction to be able to create something worthwhile and desirable. Um, so those are just some beginning points to be thinking about as I go through some of these questions. Um, and Ruby just posted this, but I do want to just remind everybody that if you post comments or you make, just remember that your name is linked to it and you know, we do use this video, it gets posted in the group, we do use segments of it um, in other areas. So just make sure that anything you say, you are comfortable with it being um, knowable to others. Okay, so let me just take up the first question. Um, is it possible to develop sexual attraction towards your spouse if physical attraction was never there in the first place? She says, I was not attracted to my husband when I first met him, but I quickly developed a strong emotional, intellectual, and spiritual attraction to him. I thought physical attraction didn't matter. Sex was a big, big letdown when we got married. We were both virgins at the time, 
And even though we figured out quickly how to give me an orgasm, I have always dreaded sex. We've now been married over 10 years and it hasn't gotten better. I understand JFF's awesome advice regarding not seeing sex as a chore and bringing in your whole self. And we've worked on that, but there's this huge block. Um, my husband and I have had lengthy, painful, and incredibly candid conversations in the last two months. I told him I was sexually repulsed by him in many aspects. He has um, changed his attitude and behavior on everything I brought up to try and increase my desire. While I'm extremely grateful for everything he has done to take care of the children, take on several household chores, improve his personal hygiene and the way he dresses, and for being such a wonderful spouse, it hasn't had any impact on my sexual desire. I see him as a brother. The thought of seeing him naked turns me off. I have to try really hard to focus on the areas of his body that I'm attracted to when I think about when I'm, I think I'm, the sentence is not quite right, but during sex. I feel shallow and selfish saying this, but it's been a hopeless battle trying to change the way I feel or tell myself that attraction isn't necessary. I've discovered that I only enjoy sex when I at least take part in initiating it, but I rarely do so because I don't want him sexually. Even when I initiate sex, I often have to fight intrusive thoughts of other attractive men during sex with whom I've never been anywhere close to intimate with. I've always been 100% loyal to him, but I feel trapped. My husband has also been trying to lose body fat and gain muscle mass to become more physically attractive. When he started his diet a few months ago, his BMI was in the obese range and he has always been at least somewhat overweight. While I'm appreciative of this and proud of him, I don't know if I'll ever desire him more when he reaches his fitness goals, which, I, which is to have less body fat than ever. Okay. So I'm going to take this up at the meaning level um, because so I think a really important question for this person to think about is why did I marry someone that I wasn't attracted to? And I understand that we give short shrift to physical attraction and that many of us can sort of imagine that that doesn't matter and we're at least able to borrow that cultural idea to say it's okay for me to uh, marry this person that I'm not very attracted to. But I think um, an important thing to think about is what worked for me in marrying someone I'm not attracted to? Especially if you were attracted to other people. If you were attracted to other people and then you went and married someone you were less attracted to, why? And I think uh, that this is a deeply unkind thing to do to someone, of course. And a lot of times we are motivated, especially I've seen with clients of mine, where the woman is very ambivalent about her sexuality. Maybe she was actually fairly sexual before marriage and feels like sex is something bad people do or that you have to be bad to be sexual. And so you marry somebody who's safe in the sense that you aren't going to have to deal with the issue of your sexuality uh, you can sort of put them in the category of, you know, a family member and relate to them as such so that you don't have to deal with your sexual ambivalence. Uh, you don't have to have the exposure of it. You don't have to expose to yourself your own eroticism nor expose to someone else. And oftentimes people will choose somebody that they can kind of get away with that with, the, you know, the nice accommodating partner the apologetic partner, that this person that you know you can maybe pull this off with. and But it's a really unkind thing to do because, as we'll look at in the next question, it is extraordinarily painful to be with someone that you know doesn't desire you, doesn't think you're attractive, and to constantly have that being reflected back to you. Um, so thinking about this from the meaning level is saying, you know, I have done something to my spouse. I have married them. It's not like, you know, sometimes people are very much attracted. This was in the second question. And then the desire goes away once they get married. And we can think about what that means, but at least it's, it's one is engaged in the relationship, um, imagining that this is going to be something that they can create together. So, 
what I think this person asking this question is doing is she is seeing herself as being trapped when she has set up the trap. She is saying, I'm trapped in a marriage with somebody I'm not attracted to, but I set it up to be this way. And I've done this to him. He hasn't done this to me. The reason why that's really important is I think from the way that she's asking this question, ownership of her choices is really fundamental to her desire. And feeling that she is a victim or doesn't have choices makes her feel repulsed and makes her feel very low desire. So if it's framed that I have to take care of this person whom I'm not attracted to, that I don't really want to be with, and I have no choices, the sense of repulsion is going to be high. The sense of, you know, feeling that you, and sex is so intimate, right? And on some level, how do I say it? It's disgusting behavior. I mean, I don't, I know I'm a big sex enthusiast, but what I mean by it is, is, is if there's not attraction, if it's not clear that you want it, it can very quickly go into the repulsion and the sort of disgust response, right? Because it's walking very close to that part of our brains, okay? So for sex to be desirable and attractive, you have to be clear about your choosing and about what you want. And so if this were my client, I would be talking to her about the fact that she has important choices to make. She doesn't have to be in this marriage, but she's, she did set the marriage up this way. Unless she said to her husband before they got married, look, I'm not attracted to you. I don't know if I ever will be. Are you still on board with this? And he says, yes. Well, okay, that's a more fair position. But uh, if she hid her lack of uh, sexual attraction and hoped it would just go away, she's a part of setting up a meaning in which she has entrapped him. And she doesn't she has choices she can make. When she says, that when I initiate sex, I actually feel less repulsed. That's a way of saying, when I take ownership of my choosing, I would be encouraging her to take ownership of a choice one way or the other, to choose to really create something good in this relationship and to really work with what's going on in the relationship that I feel low desire. How much is it about his self-care, right? Is it is it about him being obese and that's been a real problem, then you would think if he's really working on that, then that would be encouraging that this, I respect both his self-respect and his efforts to make the relationship better. And I respect, you know, and he's more, he's easy. I don't have to think about, you know, his character so much, right, to make it him desirable. Um, but then you can be thinking more about, or am I not attracted because I have too much control in this marriage. That I've kept him in a sort of one down position because he can always feel that I don't desire him, which can be a reason why people sometimes won't desire, is it can keep the other person always coming towards them. And then I see him as kind of pathetic, that he keeps sort of, you know, uh, trying to get me to tell him he's okay, even though I'm a part of that dynamic and a part of that system, that I find it unattractive because it seems so spineless. Okay, now, I'm not trying to insult the husband here. I'm saying to the wife, if she were my client, that you are participating in a meaning that makes your husband unattractive to you and you're keeping it alive. Um, the wife actually wrote a little bit more because we reached out to people before we do and say, are you okay if we take up your question? And she just added uh, that she's been attracted to someone else. Let me just find that quickly. Um, hasn't acted on it. And, um, and she's never crossed any boundaries with him in, in any way. Uh, but she did tell her husband about it. And let's see, there's, um, oh, just that her husband has had some struggles with pornography that she's that he's kept from her so um, let me just get back to what my so one thing that she said in the question is that sometimes she will imagine more attractive people well yeah I'll tell you for myself in my head I'm always way more attractive than in reality <laughs> when I was eight nine months pregnant in my imagination I was slender okay and so I have a terrific imagination and, and that's very helpful and you know it's okay in a sense that we are me and our minds sort of appeal to the archetypal 
um, notions of attractiveness. I don't, I don't think that's a betrayal necessarily. If it's about creating a good sexual relationship, sometimes I'll remember my husband when we were first married, you know, just young, muscular, tall, you know, I, that's just sometimes in my mind, right? That's, that's an attractive part of my memory and the reality and I'm also thinner and younger <laughs> that's okay I think to do that when it's in the uh, effort to develop and build a good sexual relationship so you can play with those meanings but the most important thing in this question is this issue of asserting a choice and you don't you know am I gonna really choose this man and am I going to really try and create something good with him and deal with my responsibility in the position that we are currently in? I have, I have made him manage a feeling of being undesirable for a long time because of how I've related to him. I have been a part of creating an awkward sexual experience that is undesirable to me. Um, I haven't until maybe recently started to be more collaborative around is there some way that we can really change this and I would not be waiting for the feelings to happen to you the feelings come second I would be pushing myself around what's my responsibility here am I going to be a more fair kind partner to this person uh, as a way to atone for the meanings that we've set up earlier and where can we take this? Because if you start to take deeper ownership, you're being more fair, your husband is dealing with his part in the lack of attraction, and uh, you're creating something better, kinder, more collaborative, he will also become more attractive. I mean, the meanings you make will drive the feelings. Now, I'm not here to say that I know any person could be attracted to any other person. You may do your part to make this right and feel like I really can't I can't choose him I can't collaborate with him even though I know I've been unfair up to this point um, and I really can't do it then I think the fair position is to allow the other person to be straight about that to take ownership of your choice to take ownership of your position so that you don't hijack someone's sense of self in the name of goodness, that you're sticking it out, even though you have to put up with this unattractive person, that you're taking more ownership of who you're gonna be so that person can make clear-headed choices for themselves. Um, does anybody have any questions or thoughts about that? I'm just gonna scroll, no, is it? And anything that anyone wants to say before I go to the next question, which takes up sort of the other side of this? I'm seeing lots of people that I know, which is fun to see your names coming coming up. Okay, I'm not seeing questions, but maybe that there's just a lag. So I will keep going um, and then see if they come in. Um, then writes the question um, that she wants to feel more sexually desirable. She says, my husband doesn't particularly like sex and has confessed he doesn't have sexual desire for me and was disappointed by my body. He's very apprehensive about touching me and I've regressed to a point in my life where I have incredible self-loathing and disgust. I can't even stand him touching me now, even though I desperately want the kind of touch where he's enjoying me and enjoying my body. I've tried what JFF suggests to ask what makes me undesirable and he's kind of just answered that there are other ways I'm desirable besides sexually. So I'm just trying to lose weight, but it makes him upset that I feel like I need to do that for him and isn't convinced that if I did lose weight that he would find me desirable anyway. Uh, so she says, I can't even stand touching, I can't stand him touching me now. And I imagine this is because she feels the rejection in it. She doesn't feel desirable. Uh, uh, it says, even though I desperately want the kind of touch where he's enjoying me and enjoying my body. I've tried what JFF suggests to ask what makes me undesirable to him, and he's kind of just answered that there are other ways that I'm desirable besides sexually, which is to not really answer the question, right? 
So I'm just trying to lose weight, but it makes him upset that I feel like I need to do that for him, and he isn't convinced that if I did lose weight, that he would find me desirable anyway. I know it's not his job to make me feel any certain way, and that he can't control how he feels, but I'm feeling a lot of resentment and anger for falling back into the thoughts and feelings about myself that I've been working so hard to curb. I felt before I met and while we were dating that I finally really loved myself and my body. And since being married, I feel so rejected and so unseen. Yes, really hard. We've talked about it. Let me just make sure nobody's trying to tell me anything. Good, okay. Um, we've talked about it and he feels bad that I feel that way and that things are this way and is frustrated because I bring it up only after a while and he thinks things are fixed and fine which is just interesting what he would imagine is fixed or fine but I don't feel they're fine or that much better just marginally I know I'm part of the problem because I'm forcing faking it a bit too much to try and draw him in and make him feel desirable I'm sorry and make him feel desired and maybe excited but only just over a year in to marriage I'm assuming and our sex already feels so formulaic and going through the motions right because there's too much dishonesty and pretense in it and people talk about feeling awkwardness or you know pre or um, formulaic it's that there's too much anxiety or pretense it feels like he's only up for sex to scratch the itch assuming that's his itch and not to connect I don't know how to get to connecting I don't know how to get back to feeling self-confident when there has been a consistent reminder of how undesirable I am to him. I also am feeling apprehensive and disappointed, dreading the idea that we are going to be having basically subpar sex for the rest of our marriage because he's fine with it this way. I just want to make a comment right there. It's just very, there's some very telling sort of pictures here, which is he is fine with it as it is which is very interesting right because he's not the one writing and saying I don't know what to do I, I'm not attracted and I feel so distressed he's fine with scratching the itch having this is from her perspective of course but that her perception of him is that he's fine with low contact sex fine with at least feeling little attraction or at least saying he feels little attraction and um, not wanting it to get solved by her being okay with the status quo, right? So that it's just an interesting position. That's not the position that you might expect, which is this person is saying, oh my goodness, I'm not as attractive as I was hoping I was going to be. It's like, I just want to manage uh, in the way that I am already from at least her perspective of her husband. So the woman goes on to write, where can I learn how to make sex better for him so that he enjoys and that's again a very interesting the locus of control here is in her she's trying to get him to desire her more to want it more and imagining that that is sort of her problem to solve rather than taking a deeper look at the husband in this in this dynamic which i will do in a minute uh, where can I learn how to make myself more sexually desirable or do I just need to accept that he doesn't like sex and I have to accept that our sex life is going to be mediocre forever which again is another question which is is this that he doesn't like sex and therefore he wants to not be attracted and he wanted to set up a relationship like that because he doesn't want to really have a deep contact sexual relationship or is it that he does like sex and could be attracted but is not attracted to you wife right uh so um i'll come to that question just just a second um so let me see do i need to accept that he doesn't like okay then she just added this bit when she knew we were going to answer the question she said the only thing i would add is that from the comments because this was posted originally in the group a lot of people thought he might be gay, and he says he definitely is not. He's also very kind. His response about not having attraction or desire only came from direct questioning. He never wanted to say it, and only really did when probed. My biggest question is how do you get to a place where you can both connect um, if he doesn't have attraction and desire? 
And she says, oh, and there was attraction and desire when we were dating, which is very important information. So, okay. So let me just, again, just give some of my thoughts and then I'll take a look at any questions that you all are asking. Um, okay. So the fact of attraction before that goes away once you get married is interesting and important. Uh, and let me just sort of speak more generally and then I'll bring it in closer to this question. I think that a lot of people have an easier time feeling attraction when it's in the frame of being forbidden. Right? So you may feel a lot of attraction for your spouse because it's forbidden, because it's the thing you shouldn't feel. And so you are very clear that this is yours, that it's coming from you. Uh, if you feel desire, not something you're supposed to do or should do or anything like that. And so it, it can feel exciting um, to the sexuality sort of entangled with um, the forbidden and it's desirable. But when people get married, that, that the level of exposure in sexuality, um, a lot of times people don't want to sustain the level of, of exposure that is inherent to sexuality. So they find instinctively a way to shut it down. Um, people also can feel like sex is bad, as I said earlier, and I don't want to bring that into marriage. I don't want it to be a corrosive impact on the marriage, so I want to shut it down. Um, so another dynamic, and I think this is often true for men towards women, you know, the questioner talks about her husband as being a very nice guy. And I think that there are a lot of men who um, have a much more ambivalent relationship to women than they fully realize, and it gets played out in their marriage. That is that they were often in a caretaking position with their mothers and they um, had both this need to be the nice guy who accommodates the needs or the demands of the female. It gives them a sense of self, a sense of superiority often, but also a high level of contempt. and. A sense that being open to a woman or having your own pleasure with her is both not safe and not legitimate and so sometimes men and this may happen with women too but I'm just thinking of it in this particular frame right now um, will marry someone that they move into a kind of caretaking nice guy role with but they have a really hard time eroticizing their wife and they, <clears throat> sometimes she can be needy. I don't know if that's true here or not, but it makes it so that it feels sort of parent-child and not desirable. Um, it feels like from this question that the husband wants to have orgasms, wants to have a certain amount of sex, but doesn't really want to choose and collaborate with his wife. And so while she is saying, he only said these things when I pushed for the information. Um, he is holding a degrading position with her, and much in the same way that I was talking about in the first question, where he allows it to be true in his mind that he will have sex with her while not desiring her and valuing her, and she can feel it. And it's very hard on her sense of self, as it would be, that, you know, some minds are dangerous to be around because you can be pretty good at sustaining your sense of self, but then keep having a partner who lives in a devaluing position relative to you and your desirability, which is a position. You know, it's, it often gets framed up as he can't do anything about this. But just as I was saying in the first question, it is a position that we often indulge to not take up the responsibility we have. We've, we've asked this person to join our life to have it be a sexually exclusive relationship. And then a lot of us want to bail on our half of the deal of creating something good, desirable, sustainable, and functioning in a way that uh, you can create something that is meaningful for both of you. And so I think there's a lot more control in this husband's position than is evident to either of them right now that it is a way of keeping a power position between them 
at the same time that he's selling it as he's a nice guy. This is not a guy who doesn't want to have sex because that might be, well, is he gay or is he not, you know, asexual or something like that. But he wants to have a certain kind of sex where he gets what he wants, but he doesn't value her, do his part to really collaborate with her. And of course, if there were really something that's interfering in desire or making the relationship better, it's not that you have to feel desire all the time. The way of choosing is to address those things collaboratively with an aim of solving and making better the situation. And so the information is shared in a way of trying to deal with um, what is actually happening and what can be changed. You know, a lot of times we lose desire when there are meanings that are happening in the marriage. Things that you are seeing and understanding about your spouse, understanding about yourself, uh, things that are undesirable, seeing aspects of your spouse that you do not like, that have wreaked havoc on your happiness, whatever it is. And so their presence can really impact desirability, even if there is no objective desirability problem. I have this happen a lot, where I'll work with one partner and they'll say, I'm just not attracted to my spouse and, you know, just, you know, so hard, blah, blah. And then I say, well, let's do some couples work and, and address it from the marital position. And then their spouse comes in, the spouse is perfectly attractive like in any conventional sense this is not an issue of they are married to someone who doesn't take care of themselves or who is you know uh, not desirable from an aesthetic perspective but the meanings are infecting their ability to uh, create to, to instinctively want to have sex the issue is then what do I need to address or deal with with my spouse to make this possible um, I have one more question I'm just going to touch on here, but let me just see what some of you are saying. Okay, hang on a sec. Let's see. It says, I've got a question. I've never really considered myself as sexually desirable. I'm sure that I can be, and I hope that I am, but it's just never occurred to me to think of myself that way until marriage, probably because of our culture about sex. Now I sometimes feel frustrated at not feeling sexually desired, and I don't really have a framework for being sexually desirable. I'm not attracted to male bodies, so other than trying to be more fit or muscular, I'm not sure what to do in order to seduce my wife. How can I work on developing that in myself? And then this, can you elaborate on meaning? So how can you develop this? It's a good question. I just need to think about it for a minute. Um, let me just kind of go broad a minute and then come in a little bit on that question. Um, one thing that I see often in um, working with a higher desire person is that they are often ambivalent about sexuality also, even though they're in the high desire position. And what they have unwitt unwittingly been a part of often is that they need their spouse's desire to validate their desirability and to validate the legitimacy of sex. And they're turning to somebody who has her or his own ambivalence about sex to manage the higher desire person's uncertainty. So I think that's part of this question, which is that, you know, first of all, I came into a sexual relationship with some ambivalence about whether or not it's legitimate to even think in those terms around desirability and desire and sexiness and so on. So I am not well prepared to um, yet to be able to kind of hold on to the legitimacy of my desirability and the legitimacy of my desires. And so it's easy in that position to resent that your spouse doesn't do it, but not do that internal work that's fundamental to creating something better. Um, I am going to be doing a men's sexuality course that will be available to everybody in the fall. I'm going to be doing a couple iterations of it before then um, that I'm working on right now. But um, one of the pieces I'll be taking up is this issue of how do you own your the legitimacy of your desirability and of your desires without being tyrant or narcissistic in your marriage. and. I think it comes down to, I mean, sex is so fundamental to being human and sexual desire is fundamental to being human. And so um, the way you get better able to validate this is to be more 
able to reject the messages that made it be about badness and uh, something that somebody else has to make legitimate through their desire for you and more around being able to own within yourself that um, that, that your uh, sexual desires are legit and your desirability is there and, and it doesn't have to be through how you look aesthetically it can be about the kind of person that you know you are and that you're uh, a human being that it would be in good judgment to want to be close to okay now I'll give you more concrete around this when we do the men's course but it, this is the basic framing because I think a way a, a lot of high desire people approach something that they want to do or try is they are in a pressuring position because they're trying to get the validation of the other person or make me feel like I'm desirable rather than holding their own and saying I would like to do this or I want to be sexual with you or I like you um, and holding their own likability uh, while letting the other person make their own choice so this is the stuff that I deal with all the time in the in the couples relationship course and the couples sexuality course which is this learning how to better anchor into your own sense of self and into your desires it's the foundational piece of being able to be collaborative within a marriage I was working with a client this morning who was referencing these moments that have started to happen to her more as she's growing of being able to just be at peace in her own skin while there are other people around her that may want different things but being able to be really okay with herself and the peace that's there but also the way it impacts how she interacts with others that they aren't people that she needs to get validation from approval from get to do the things that she wants but that she can really know them enjoy them uh, and that she's also easier to be with when she's in this place and this is foundational for creating intimate relationships and sexually intimate relationships. Let me just see what, um, this is uh, in response to the first question. I wanna add my testimony to the truth of what JFF is saying. Hang on, let me see. Just go. Doing this on my phone is so awkward, but it's, my headset's not been working with Facebook lately. I came, to a second mar um, I came into a second marriage to a spouse that I wasn't totally attracted to. I felt more safe with him because I was in an abusive first marriage and I was also sexually abused as a child. Yes, it, excellent. It's a very common way to handle the deep anxiety about sex. Our marriage blended our families and entailed a lot of stress and it brought out much of my wanting to control so many things, including our sex life. This type of relationship also brought out a lot of passiveness in him which was even more reason to not be attracted to him. Yes, exactly. So he's now accommodating your control, which makes him seem even less desirable because you know you're getting more control than you deserve. And you know it's a weakness in him that he is accommodating it, um, even though it looks nice. And so it becomes all the easier to be disrespecting and non-desiring. After 20 years of marriage, I was blessed to be able to be introduced to sorry to scroll down to uh to jennifer through a podcast and i began to seek out more and more wealth of information she shared in various podcasts after learning what i could from all that she shared i suddenly realized that i never showed adoration to my husband after i realized that it flipped a switch in me i broke down and told my husband what i discovered and have been learning I was in tears. It, it's been a year since I've shared this with him and since then I've started the Art of Desire course and we've started the relationship course and it has helped tremendously. My attraction to him has increased so, so much and it has been an amazing blessing in our lives. Wow, that's wonderful. That is so cool and that makes me happy. So that's fantastic and, and you know when you take you know when I'm in an indulgent position or I'm feeling sorry for myself my husband's not attractive you know and how could he be because I'm being a twit <laughs> when I confront my own indulgent position or my own immature position not only does it change the dynamic but it allows me to be in a position of acting and creating a different meaning because of who I'm being so going back to that was asking can can you elaborate on meanings you know uh, meaning you can't just make up meanings right but you can look at what is the meaning that's in fact happening what is going on and what is my role here 
right? What is it that I'm doing that's creating something negative and it's so easy for our minds to see what our spouse is doing and why that's a problem. We're very, very bad as human beings at looking, this is Satan's playground, it's not sex, it's self-deception. We're very bad at looking at our own participation in the problematic dynamic. When we can see it, and this is what I'm always trying to help people do, is to see themselves accurately. It hurts, I sound harsh sometimes, but it's when you can see it, just as Linda was talking about a minute ago, then you can say like, oh my gosh, like I've been blind to my own participation in the misery and I want to change my own part. That is to create, first of all, that is implicitly a meaning of greater courage, of greater kindness. It's an act of love. It's an act of faith that you are stepping towards creating something better and cleaning up your part and being willing to take the hit. You know, she's going to her husband and saying, I've been really unfair to you. I've been doing this to you and I'm so, so sorry. Well, that is a desirable woman because she's willing to look at herself, but she's also more in a position to desire and to choose because she's saying, I want to create a better meaning between us by really confronting my own part. And so you, you change meanings by looking at what is and confronting where you are acting out of alliance with what you believe is good and right. Uh, let me just look at Heather's question and then I'll probably quickly address the other one and stop. Um, Heather says, I feel like I get stuck in the past dynamics that used to play out. My husband used to shut down any negative emotions that I used to express. Um, it was like I wasn't allowed to be anything but happy. We separated for one and a half years and he finally realized what he was doing and went to therapy and we got back together. Now he has really changed. He's super sweet and very empath empathetic, and I know I can trust him with my feelings and thoughts, but I find myself still constantly worried about making him happy, keeping him from getting angry, like it's still my job to make him happy, like I used to. Hang on, I just gotta reread that. But I find myself still constantly worried about making him happy, keeping him from getting angry, like it's still my job to make him happy like I used to. Um, although he tells me just to allow him to have his frustrated feelings and not take it personally. For years, our sex life was about keeping him satisfied. We stopped having regular sex a few months ago because he said he didn't want duty sex anymore. We've done it a few times, but I still feel like it's hard to get desire for yourself, I'm assuming. Maybe from him, you mean, I'm not sure. But I've done all the courses. I just feel stuck in the old habits. How do you get the mental shift to make it about you when it's been so physically and emotionally painful and the sex you have had hasn't been the sex you desire? So um, what I would say, sounds like you've made progress, but you're having a hard time kind of sustaining in a trustworthy way that you trust your ability as a couple to stay in a better meaning frame. Your husband says, no, I can still have a hard time. I can still go into my regressive position of blaming you. Um, or maybe he's not even blaming you, but you go into your regressive position and you are taking it on as if it's yours to solve. That's your vulnerability as a couple. It's been wired into your minds. You've been able to rise above it. But I think when you're under some anxiety or not paying attention, it's what you can slip back towards. That's how we are as human beings. What I would say is uh, two things, and this is related to the, uh, the third question I was just gonna touch on quickly, um, is that you need more practice in dealing with the meanings that infect your happiness. And what I would suggest is that you do in the Enhancing Sexual Intimacy course, that you go back to the exercises. And especially because your husband's saying, I don't wanna have this bad meaning sex anymore. That's perfect because what I would be working on is that if you're each clear about what your role is in the bad dynamic that you go and take on too much your husband can diffuse his anger into you that's your bad dynamic and that you go through the hugging exercise for example and you get better at calming yourself down and anchoring into yourself when you are pressed up against your spouse's body like the client I was re referring to um, from this morning this is an act of when she was really in her own skin. It's just an act of calming herself down deeply. Uh, not that she didn't still have challenges and vulnerabilities and things like that, but when she'd settled down, she could be in her own skin, be at peace. 
and really be with uh, the people around her. And this is very s the same idea in the hug, is you're settling down completely and learning how to, your mind gets practiced in being settled in your own skin while you're with your spouse, not doing the old dynamic. The old dynamic is a way of managing anxiety. Your husband manages it by diffusing it into you. You manage it by trying to control it, like imagining that you can clean up his mess and keep him happy with you. And those are both anxiety management strategies that work in the immediate sense, but make you miserable ultimately. The hug and all the exercises that follow that are about managing anxiety within yourself about what you're responsible for, which is belonging to your own sense of self while you're with your spouse. So you need practice doing it. Um, the um, other question that was, came in was about sexual aversion with a spouse. Um, she says, I'm dealing with sexual aversion, aversion with my spouse. I'm in recovery. My loved one has been abused in all forms. I'm just gonna pause a little bit. Um, in the past, but the last few years it has gotten better. I have been working on myself and what I can do, but lately I just have real sexual aversion to him. If he touches me, I just want to get away from him. I feel like because he has crossed so many boundaries with me and I allowed it, I don't really know what or how to try to be different and trust him. He hasn't really proven to be respectful of my wishes or requests to be left alone, even if it's just a simple brush of my bum or whatever. I get so irritated I can't even think about any touching, let alone sex. So again, this sounds like a situation in which there has been some progress from sort of the darkest places in this relationship, but it's still not a collaborative relationship. When you're saying, you know, I don't feel like my husband can respect sort of basic wishes to be left alone or that no is not a no for him, that is the aversion is about the meaning that you, it's not a safe place to be. You don't yet have the clarity that you two are capable of collaboration. And so while there's been some progress, it's not far and deep enough and sustainable enough for you to deal with your aversion. And I would recommend the same thing, that you go through the exercise, you go through the Enhancing Sexual Intimacy course again, if you have it, and uh, go through those steps of confronting what is the part I have to deal with. And if I'm committed enough to this partnership, then I want to learn how to deal with it when I'm close to him. It's not about hugging your spouse. It's about learning how to be... Uh, within your own responsibility and within your own skin when you're with your spouse, whether or not they're doing it. Because you get more ability to trust yourself to anchor into your own skin, anchor into yourself while you're with him. And that's fundamental to good sex. That's a meaning that you, if you're going to have good sex in a long-term relationship, it's knowing how to be that collaborative person, knowing how to be at peace in your own skin when you're with your spouse, that you can create something deep, meaningful, creative, alive. Okay, so I'm going to stop. Thanks for being here, everybody. I hope you're staying sane and healthy. Oh, um, oh, office hours. Thanks for being just put. There's some of you who didn't get your questions answered. If you have a course, uh, when you buy the course, you do get access to office hours. And so you can ask questions in office hours uh, similar to today where I will be taking up questions that you have. So that's a good way to get more access to me if you want it. Okay. Thanks everybody and I will see you in a few weeks. Bye.